So welcome, Seth, to Escape the Rat Race Radio. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me. Thanks for doing this show. Oh, you're very welcome. And where in the world are you right now? I'm outside of uh, New York City in a little town called Hastings on Hudson, New York, right near the Hudson River, which is actually a fjord, uh, brackish water that goes in and out of the Atlantic Ocean. Awesome stuff. Now, Seth, obviously you are known worldwide. You have been in the game, shall we say, of marketing and helping entrepreneurs for a number of years now, many successful books. But for those that perhaps don't know so much about you, would you mind giving us your 30 second elevator pitch? Well, no one ever bought anything on an elevator. So uh, I, how about this? I came up uh, from the business side. I worked at a fast growing software company in the early 80s and I've been in a the book business and a teacher since then, since 86. I helped invent parts of the internet. I wrote a book called Permission Marketing. I write one of the most popular blogs in the world at Seth's Stop Blog. And my 19th book is coming out right now. It's called This Is Marketing. And it's about making the change you seek to make in the world. Yeah. Great stuff. And we're really talking to aspiring entrepreneurs today, and most of them will be at the early stage of launching their businesses and perhaps not even quite figured it out at all. I'd really love to know, Seth, what's your definition of an entrepreneur? Let's start with what it's not. It's not a freelancer. Freelancers get paid when we work, uh, either by the hour or by the project. And entrepreneurs are different. Entrepreneurs are on the hook to build something much bigger than themselves something they can sell, something that they can uh, pay off their investors from. And if you are a freelancer, but you think you're an entrepreneur, you're going to be stressed out of your mind because every time you have work to get done, you'll hire yourself to do it because you're the best qualified and cheapest person available. But if you keep hiring yourself to do the work, then you won't be doing any of the work necessary to be the entrepreneur. So I used to be an entrepreneur. I've built companies, I've sold them, but I like the life of a freelancer better. And so if I'm going to add any value in the beginning of this podcast, it's to help some of your listeners realize they're actually freelancers and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And in your experience, Seth, what are some of the, the common challenges that people have when they decide that they want to start a business? They're passionate. They've got an idea. What are some of the pitfalls that, that they encounter often in those early days? Okay. So let's make a quick list. The number one, thinking you need an original idea. You don't. Number two, thinking that you need to serve a very large market. You don't. That in, in the book, This Is Marketing, I talk a lot about picking the smallest viable market, not the biggest one. If you pick a small market that you are committed to, that you're on the hook to, you're much more likely to make extraordinary products and services. And then I guess the third big pitfall is not acknowledging your fear. Your fear is what's going to sabotage you your fear is what's going to make you either think too big or too small, either go too fast or too slow as a way of sabotaging yourself before you get to the point where it might not work. Mm, yeah, we, we talk about fear a lot on, on the podcast and within the group, Seth. And I think personally, the only way to overcome fear is simply by doing it and just stretching that comfort zone. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I don't think you can overcome the fear. I think you can learn to live with it. I think you can dance with it. I think you can use it as a compass. So if you find yourself facing off head to head with the fear, trying to talk it down, and you find yourself asking your friends and advisors for reassurance, uh, you're trapped because there's no amount of reassurance that's helpful. Reassurance is futile. That instead what you need to know is this might not work. In fact, it's probably not going to work, but I'm going to do it anyway, and here's why. Mm -hmm. And, and do you have any statistics? I, we see a lot thrown around about, you know, the success rate of business owners and entrepreneurs. I mean, just from your real life experience, what's the balance of those that make it and those that don't? Well, I would say 87% of all statistics are made up. And uh, after that, I would say that what you really need to worry about is not failing. It's almost succeeding because most small business people almost succeed meaning you're getting enough revenue and enough feedback to stay in the game, but not to be happy with it. And it's that horrible middle ground that eats us alive. A, a, a fast failure is fine. We can handle that. A big success is wonderful. We can handle that. But when you're in that middle grind, you have to be really clear about what your boundaries are. Because if you're not, you're just going to get swallowed by it. 
Yeah, great. And I guess that's really the the essence of true marketing, isn't it? Is understanding how to position yourself. And we're going to dive into some of that in a moment, Seth. But I'd just like to rewind you back. Was there ever a time when you would say yourself, you were stuck in the rat race, uh, trading time for money and, and really not feeling like you were fulfilling your potential each day? Oh, I would say more than half my life. I, I spent 10 full years as a struggling, failing entrepreneur slash freelancer, underwater, um, doubting myself, and really trapped. And, you know, when you asked me to be on the podcast, the, the narrative of the podcast is what appealed to me because it's one thing to say, you're going to get out of the rat race because you will find a piece of wisdom that will solve all your problems. But it's another thing to be able to realize 80% of the rat race is in your head. And that if we can get, come to grips with that story we tell ourselves, we can enjoy the journey 100 times more even when we're not actually succeeding. Because what a privilege it is to be able to do these things we do. That I've been to Borelli, India. I've been to rural Kenya. I've been uh, in many places in the world where this is not an option. And the fact that you can open a laptop in a coffee shop with Wi-Fi and connect to people around the world and create value for them, it's a privilege right out of a science fiction novel. This is what the fancy people get to do. So it's, if you're telling yourself the story that you are failing in a rat race not of your own making, I'm hoping I can encourage you to tell yourself a different story. Yeah, absolutely. And if I'm not you know, incorrect, your entrepreneurial journey when you've been you've been writing are we close to kind of 30 years or so now that you've really been in business yourself yeah it's so uh i quit my job in 86 so it's 32 years ago yeah yeah and and was there a defining moment when you quit your job was there something did you have that i can't take it anymore type thing that that's <laughs> I, had the, I had the opposite i had the opposite uh, i wanted to work there for the rest of my life yeah uh it was all of the fun part of creating with none of the personal responsibility of the P&L. Mm. But uh, the company was in Boston and I was getting married and my wife said, we're moving to New York. So there you go. It all worked, <laughs> it all worked out okay, but it wasn't take this job and shove it. It was, I love this work. How do I replicate this environment for the rest of my life? Yeah. And at that point, Seth, did you have any future vision of goals of really kind of setting yourself something to, to go out and, and reach or has that just evolved step by step along the way? I had two goals. One goal was to do projects, not to build a job, but to do a series of projects. And I posted a list of those of 30 of those projects. And that was a thrilling uh, thing to have come true. And then the second thing, which is astonishing, but true is, I wanted to be able to do this. I wanted to be able to go on a podcast with you and talk about stuff to people around the world. I wanted to be the teacher that I know I am. And so I had to figure out before there was an internet, before you could do online learning, how to work my way to the point where I could have enough of a platform that I could teach. Mm -hmm. So I'm super lucky both happened. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dive in then, Seth, and let's talk a bit more about marketing. I'd say your specialist subject there, I say. Um, for those listening, give us your definition of what is marketing. It's pretty simple. Um, marketing is work that matters for people who care. It's making a change happen in the world that you are proud of. And the essence of marketing is one sentence, which is people like us do things like this. Figure out who people like us are. You figure out what things like this are. And then you figure out how to change the culture so that sentence becomes true. Mm. And I know you talk a lot about storytelling. What would be some advice for an early stage entrepreneur who has a great idea? They all, we all have a story, of course, but perhaps they've not actually thought about their story and how it applies to creating value for others. Is there any tips for someone who's trying to piece that together? Well, the word story is tricky, and I would use a different word if I had one. So, for example, the headphones you choose to use on the tube are story. If you're wearing Apple wireless earbuds, you're telling a story. If you're wearing giant Beats, oversized ones, you're telling a story. When people 
see you or they see your work and they react in any way, they are reacting to the story that they tell themselves. So we have to tell that story on purpose. Are you a venture-backed, arrogant, shiny, high-tech company? Are you somebody who uh, communicates the idea of Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley when you show up in the room? Are you a nursery school teacher? What's your story? So it's not once upon a time. It's realize that we, as humans, hear pictures and smells long before we hear the words. And so what pictures are you using? What symbols, what semiotics, so that I know what category to put you in? Because if I can't figure out how to put you in a category, I'm going to ignore you. Yeah. And I know one of the well-known sayings from Simon Sinek is people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So do you agree that the, the emphasis on, on really understanding your reasons, your purpose is often mentioned, your big why, does that need to be front and center with marketing? I don't think it does. And Simon and I are happy to disagree about this. Uh, we disagree all the time when we're together. <laughs> uh, no one cares about your why. They care about what they think your why is. That's totally different. There, you have a noise in your head, but I can't hear it. All I can hear is what I can hear. And so, you know, someone who buys a pair of Nike sneakers thinks that the people at Nike want them to perform their best. But it's entirely possible that the person who designed those sneakers just wants the stock price to go up. If they act like they want you to do your best, and that's what you hear, that's enough, right? That, yes, I think when making important life decisions, you better be really clear about your motivation. But marketing is about what we hear, not what you say. And would you agree that a customer, shall we say, in their heads, they're thinking, what's in it for me? Always. So, so you, That's the only thing they care about. Yeah. So, but so the, let, Let's be clear. If someone gives 50,000 pounds to charity, what do they get? Right? They don't get a $50,000 tote bag or an unlimited lifetime supply of chocolate, what they get is the story they tell themselves. I am a philanthropist. I have high status. I am a generous person. I made things better. And they will only make a 50,000 pound donation if they think it's worth 60,000 pounds. Because if it's not a bargain, they're not going to buy it. Because human beings are always looking for something that's worth doing and avoiding things that they think aren't worth doing. Which would come down to obviously understanding where the value is and, and, and where do people perceive the value to be, right? Correct. And, it, and what you think the value is, isn't nearly as important as what I think the value is. Now, I was listening to one of your, your uh, startups podcasts, uh, Seth, and, and you were talking about monopolies. And I, I really found this a fascinating uh, topic. And I thought I'd ask you about this just, you know, for those that haven't heard you talk about every business owner, yeah, every successful business has a monopoly. Would you mind just, uh, you know, expanding sure. on that? So if you go to Amazon and want to buy a bag of 100 balloons, they all look the same. They all have the same ranking. So which one are you going to buy? You're going to buy the cheapest one because that's the free market. And the problem with the free market is that no one who's selling in the free market makes an unreasonable profit. In fact, in many analyses, they don't make any profit at all because the minute they start making a profit, someone else is going to sell balloons cheaper and you'll buy those instead. The businesses that do make a profit have at some level a monopoly which means that right here and right now, I'm your best option and I'm worth extra. So if I have a leak in my kitchen and I've got a company coming over, I'm not going to get bids from 20 plumbers. I'm going to call the plumber I've worked with before. He has earned a monopoly today right here from me. And I will pay him a premium very happily because it is worth extra to me to get a known quantity 
in my house right now to fix the leak. He has a monopoly today. Now, that monopoly isn't permanent, but until he blows it, he's got a monopoly. So our goal, whether we sell to businesses or to consumers, is to say, how do I become the one and only? So if I've run the last seven marathons in Nikes and I need a new pair of sneakers, maybe I'll switch to Reebok, but I don't think so. Because right now, right here, Nike's brand has a monopoly on my money. Mm. So, Seth, who inspired you? I've heard you talk about Zig Ziglar in the past as well. Um, for me, Jim Rohn was the very first person that really switched my mind onto personal development. Is there anyone influential that you'd like to just mention that's, that's really helped you along in your career? Oh, there's too many to mention. You know, in, in the book, I talk about uh, Lester Wonderman and Jay Levinson and Bernadette Jiwa, the author out of Australia, uh, Tom Peters, but there's also, you know, my parents, they're the people I've had, the customers who have taken the time to tell me the truth about how they make decisions, the key employees who've been part of it. You know, wisdom is everywhere you decide to look for it. It might not be the wisdom of proven fame, but it might even be the wisdom of ignore everything this person says because they always say the opposite of what's true. You're still learning from that. And... Um, I'm pretty confident if people read what I read, they won't read what I read because I viewed it through my lens, not their lens. But it's also clear that we now, each of us has more access to more information than ever before. And if you're not absorbing it, then shame on you. You know, the, the marketing seminar, the online course we run, 6,000 people have taken it, which is thrilling. But why isn't it 600,000 people? Because there's 600,000. wait, I don't know. Should I pay $400 for this? It might not work. And if we prove to them it does work, the truthful answer is I shouldn't take this because it might work. Because if it works, I will change. And if it changes, that's uncertain. And I'd rather not be uncertain. So goodbye. Mm -hmm. And that fear that we all have, it's really getting in the way of what we could be creating. Mm -hmm. So with the marketing workshop there, also with the, the example about the monopolies, would you say now it's so important to have trust built through testimonials, reviews? Uh, it seems to be the first place people look is, what, you know, what are the reviews? Is this someone that I can trust? Well, everybody, Aretha Franklin, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, Harry Potter, Star Wars, they all have negative reviews. So people have been trained that the reviews aren't actually what you would experience. They're just more noise. And often when people go to the reviews, they are looking for confirmation of what they already believe, not new information. So I'm not sure it's putting up testimonials and getting reviews that matter as much as it is so delighting and overwhelming the people you serve, that they can't help but grab somebody and bring them into the circle. And they're not doing it to repay you. They're doing it because their life will get better if they spread the word about you. And mm. that's not done by making average stuff and then working hard to get reviews. It's done by making stuff that just naturally gets reviews. Mm. And with technology as, as fast moving as it is these days and, and almost an, an, an obsession with automating the whole process, do you see that as, as something that is an early um, mistake for many business owners that they just want to be so hands off with right. the business that they forget some of those organic, you know, fundamentals? Oh, this, whole, this whole passive income thing is so ridiculous. <laughs> How about active income? How about active income as a result of extraordinary care and effort that you're never going to out Amazon, Amazon. You can't make shopping faster than one click. You can't make delivery easier than one day. You can't make prices lower than theirs. So they won. They won that. The only thing that's left for us is worth waiting for, worth paying extra for, worth talking about. That's not going to happen because you're passive. That's not going to happen because you bought something for a dollar and sold it for two. 
It's going to happen because you put some other kind of effort into it. Mm. Yeah. And one thing we talk about so often is, is playing the long game, understanding that there is no quick fix. And obviously we have the get rich quick kind of phrase out there. But I think once you, once you dip your toe, you realize that there is no magic pill and that you have to play the long game and that success is a lagging indicator. Oh, I love that. It says, yes, success is a lagging indicator. Lots of people say, make me a success and then I'll work hard, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. So Seth, I've got a couple of questions from our Escape the Rat Race Facebook group. Would you, would you mind answering? Go for it. Cool. So the first one is from Marcus Seibern and he asks, given that we're inundated with marketing advice and chasing far too many shiny objects, what would be the number one thing a solopreneur should focus on to build their business? The smallest viable audience of people. Do not try to sell to strangers. Try to sell to people who already trust you, even if it's only five people. If you can so delight five people that they each tell two people, then you get 10 more. Do that eight times and you have 10,000 people. So the holy grail of I can interrupt a stranger and then that stranger will send me money is super rare. That's not how it works. Great. I'm sure that would be very helpful for, for all of our listeners. And we've not really talked about tools and resources and platforms because you think about marketing, you think about the big names out there, all of the social media. But the question from Bronwyn Vernkum here, is Facebook for business still going to be useful given the changes that are taking place? Okay, so many things to say about this. The first one is, if you're not paying Facebook, then you're not a customer, you're the product. And that's worth thinking about for a minute because that's what Facebook sells, is the attention of people like you. If you are paying Facebook, you're probably a direct marketer. And if you're a direct marketer, you should be measuring. And if you're measuring and it's working, do it more. And if you're measuring and it's not working, which is more and more the case, then it's probably not the right medium for you right now. And not everyone should be a direct marketer. Being a direct marketer is a very special case where you are measuring everything and making more money from every ad than it costs you so you can run another one. But the number of things that respond to direct marketing is very small, and I don't think you should beat yourself up if it doesn't work. So if it were up to me, if I was starting today, I would either Build a business that lives and dies on online direct marketing because if you get it right, you can scale it. Or I would build a business that has no overlap with online marketing, that's in the real world as much as I possibly could be because then you're not at the whims of Facebook's algorithm. Brilliant. I hope that's helpful, Bronwyn. So, Seth, is it 18 best selling books or have you added to that number now? <laughs> Well, hopefully this week, number 19 will arrive. Uh, don't get fooled by the idea of a best-selling book. It's not actually particularly difficult for a book to make a bestseller list somewhere. It's used often as a statement of credibility. Uh, but the other thing is, I've been writing, my first book came out in 86. So if I didn't have 18 bestsellers by now, something must be wrong. <laughs> so I'm not... I don't want that on my tombstone. I, I, I've done a lot of important things, but mostly this is about showing up. Yeah. Well, may I ask, what would you have on your tomb? What would you be proud of? Well, you know, the, the, the clever answer is either I told you I was sick or <laughs> he lasted a lot longer than anyone expected. But mostly I would like to be judged by what the people who learn from my students do. because. I am trying very hard to spread a big basket of ideas and I am lucky enough to be able to teach a million people a day. But those people are the ones who are taking that work to the world. And I could not be more proud of what I see people building. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that believer in the, the ripple effect of, you know, putting it out there and uh, just letting it spread far and wide. Yeah. So, so the new book, This Is Marketing, and it, the title is very direct. It feels like it's taken 18 books to, to, to get yeah, to this title, right? <laughs> so tell us what's, a little bit about what's inside. 
Um, I used all of the letters of the alphabet. I didn't use uh, X as many times as I expected, but all 26 letters are there. And the idea of the book is to help people understand that marketing is not interruption. It's not scammy. It's not uh, scummy. It's not spam. And it's not advertising. Marketing is everything we do and how we do it. It's the story we tell. And mostly it's the change we seek to make. And so it, I try to be uh, enthusiastic and positive because I am enthusiastic and positive about how anyone can make more of a change in the world if they just care enough to do work that matters for people who care. So it's not a tactical book. It doesn't say you should tweet on Thursday afternoons. It's a book about the philosophy behind what it takes to make a difference. Mm, fantastic. Now, I know you're probably only really about halfway through your entrepreneurial journey, Seth, but how would you describe the journey so far? Has it been enjoyable and does it get easier or more difficult? It's been thrilling. The lows have been extremely low because it's on me to be able to turn to my employees and say, I don't know if we're going to be able to make payroll tomorrow is very hard. Uh, does it get easier? By old measures, it gets much, much easier because now I don't have to worry about making payroll because I have a tiny little team. Uh, but that requires me to make up new rules. And so the thing I wrestle with the most is, what am I going to do today that's worth this platform? Because I've earned the trust of a lot of people and I don't want to waste it. And I don't want to do work that's not worth doing. But I keep raising the bar on that and that's exhausting, but I'm not complaining. I can't believe I'm lucky enough to do it. Mm -hmm. So I guess my next question would be for someone who is just starting out now in business, is it easier or more difficult? Oh, it's 10,000 times easier. Come on. You can have a blog. You can have a free email account. You can use PayPal. You can find 2 billion people on the face of the earth and they can find you. You can uh, live in the connection economy without a factory. You can create value nearly by association and connection. I mean, I can go on all day long. Mostly, you don't need any money at all to get started. You know, my dad was an entrepreneur. He needed millions of dollars to build a factory. And when I invented commercial email, I needed millions of dollars to hire people to build email services. But now, you've got a great thing you want to do and you can be proud of it and you can weave together people. Start. You can be up and, li up and live by Tuesday. And there's nothing stopping you. That won't be the way it is forever, but that's the way it is right now. Mm. And sometimes I see that actually affecting people in, in, a, in a negative way, simply because there's, there's so much to choose from. Like, what sure. do I do? The overwhelm. Um, for anyone listening who's in that position right now, Seth, you know, they're, they're literally, they know that they don't want to do the nine to five. They're, 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 that's not for them, but they cannot put their finger on what else. Yep. Any so, advice? Do not come up with an original idea, copy an idea, but bring it to a group that's not being served, a small group, create value for them, do it again. Sooner or later, if you create enough value, people will stop you and say, will you do that for me? Here's some money. But we don't need any more ideas. We got plenty of ideas. There are people working on ideas who are well-funded. Don't bring us something original. Bring us something generous. Bring us something real. Bring us something we would miss if you didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, because I guess we all have our own circles, don't we? And I'm always curious by what's out there that I don't even know about that, that I would absolutely love because there's so much. Exactly. And yeah. so go to Cleveland, find a business that's thriving in Cleveland, open a business just like that in Gloucester. Open a business just like that for left-handed people, whatever it is. There's nothing wrong with stealing a business idea. There's something wrong with stealing people's words, stealing people's trademark. You don't have to steal that. But the fundamental idea that you can help someone else create value, just go. Stop looking for perfect. Very good is good enough. Yeah. And would you say as well, at the early stages, don't think that you have to do it all on your own. If there's someone else out there doing something that you admire, that, that you love, connect with them and, and, and be of value to them. Yeah, I like that idea. I think that a lot of people will use that as a way to hide. And then you get stuck in all sorts of partner discussions. 
I'd rather have you find somebody who needs a contribution from you, one that's worth paying for, and go help them. Help them get what they need. And it can be something super simple, but it gets you started, right? So, you know, if there's a local deli or diner in town that's going through 50 dozen eggs a day and you're a regular there, say to the owner, if I can get you eggs for half price, do you want them? So suddenly now you're in the business of finding cheap eggs and bringing them to someone who needs them, who doesn't have time to go do that. You multiply that times 10, you're in business. You're the egg man. Mm. And then you said it there, just get started, right? So many yeah. people go round and round and uh, wait for perfection, but just take that first step. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, we're very nearly at the end of our time, Steph. I knew that it would fly by. I, I'm well, you're not... great at this, Christian. A real pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just before we do wrap things up, Steph, is there anything I haven't asked you with around the topic of marketing that you feel would be of value to leave our listeners with? Well, you know, I think that if you're the kind of person that's trying to leave the rat race and you think you need money to do marketing, I haven't been clear enough. The stuff I'm talking about is the posture of possibility and contribution and telling an honest story about who you are and where you're going. Begin there and the money will take care of itself. Mm. Great. Well, I hope, I hope that I'm not asking you to repeat yourself here because my final question, which I always ask my guests, Seth, is for anyone who's listening right now and they are squashed up on that subway or the train in the UK, they're, they're stuck in that traffic jam on their way to work and they really just know that they need to change. They have got so much more to give, but something's holding them back and it's most likely fear. What would be your words of advice to them listening right now? You know, when people finish the marathon, they're always tired, but they don't go to their coach and say, teach me how to run without getting tired. The people who finish the marathon are the ones who figure out where to put the tired, not to make it go away. And the same thing's true for you, that if you really are serious, stop whining, figure out where to put the fear and get to work because you don't need more time. You just need to decide. Brilliant words to leave us on, Seth. Thank you so much. I wish you all the very best of luck with the launch this week of This Is Marketing. I cannot wait to get stuck in and read all of that myself. And it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Seth. I, I wish you so Congrats. much so much luck for the rest of the year and beyond and uh, hope that our paths cross again in the near future. Well, thank you for doing this. It's super generous and uh, good luck to you with the podcast. Thank you thank so you. much, Christian.